it's my great pleasure to introduce our second speaker. Uh, Fen Putzek is going to talk about subsurface sounding on Mars and the search for water ice. Uh, Fen has a, a geophysics degree from three universities, Colorado School of Mines, uh, from Rice and CU Boulder. So one school wasn't enough, right? No, no. Uh, so now if you want to study geophysics and you want to pick the school, uh, talk to Fen. He'll tell you which one was the best. Um, after, finishing, <laughs> yeah, after finishing master's, he went to uh, oil and gas industry. He worked there for 14 years, went back to uh, CU Boulder to rebrand himself because he wanted to do planetary science. And after uh, finishing his PhD, uh, he went to Washington University, followed by Southwest Research Institute, nine years. And two years ago, he started a Denver office for Planetary Science Institute. Um, Fen actually was here a couple of months ago with us for the Mars Polar Layer Deposits. So that's when we met for the first time. And I'm looking forward to spending another week with you. Uh, thank you very much. So um, yeah, today I'm going to talk about subsurface sounding um, and the search for water ice and uh, talk a bit about the techniques that we use and what we're learning from them. Um, in the background, you see an uh, artist's rendition of the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter featuring the uh, dipole antenna here of the, the shallow radar, Sherrod, um, and uh, the artist's conception of that radar signal going down, impinging on the surface, and then penetrating down into the subsurface. Um, so there are two uh, orbital sounders currently operating at Mars. Um, Sherrod, that I just mentioned with that uh, introductory slide, um, and each and the other one is uh, MARSIS or the uh, Mars Advanced Radar for Subsurface and Ionosphere Sounding. Um, that one's on Mars Express, uh, Shroud on MRO. Um, they have quite different orbits, um, much more elliptical orbit here for Mars Express, um, nearly circular 300 kilometer orbit for MRO. They operate in different frequency bands, um, uh, one to five megahertz or so uh, for Marsis, about 20 uh, megahertz center frequency for Sherrod. Um, Sherrod has a 10 megahertz bandwidth. Um, e each of these bands in, that Marsis uses is about on the order of one megahertz wide. Um, the range resolution, or th this translates to the um, vertical resolution of the, the sounding, um, is about 15 meters for Sherrod and 150 meters um, for Marsis. And then this uh, little bit of Greek here is the uh, dielectric constant that allows you to uh, account for the media that the material is moving through. So these, these resolutions here are in free space. Um, and then if you go into the subsurface, they get smaller um, because the, the radio signals uh, travel slower in the subsurface than they do above the surface. Um, so these will translate to about eight or, um, eight or so meters in uh, water ice um, for uh, Sherrod or um, on the order of 80 meters uh, for Marsis. Um, the, at the surface, you get a kind of a footprint of the, the radar um, that can be uh, fer fairly fine in line uh, through um, synthetic aperture processing of the radar. Um, so down to 300 meters or so, up to a kilometer. Um, but the lateral resolution cross line is about three to six kilometers. In contrast, Marsis is um, somewhat coarser. Uh, 5 to 10 kilometers in line, and then 10 to 30 uh, in the cross-line direction. Um, that one seems to be dying. So, um, so how do we uh, see into the subsurface? We, we basically we record. We the signal goes down to the surface, and some fraction of it reflects back off the surface, and we record that as a a, a power change um, at the surface the at a certain time. And then at a, a later delay time, perhaps we'll get another reflection from an interface in the subsurface. Um, so this is then a, a series of these observations along an orbit track um, where we've stacked them next to each other. So you get a profile showing the surface return here, some subsurface uh, reflections from layering in the 
these uh, polar ices here. These are polar ice uh, cap radiogram. And then the delay time here kind of corresponds to the depth direction in, a say, a, an outcrop look uh, of what this might look like if you cut through the polar cap. Um, so a lot of people find radar to be sort of hocus pocus, and I, I, try, I try to uh, bring analogies that may be more close to um, understanding, um, especially when I do like a public talk uh, um, for the general populace. A lot of people uh, are familiar with the, the CAT scan technology, um, hopefully not too familiar. Um, <laughs> but uh, so yeah, the idea is you use electromagnetic radiation and you uh, have a target uh, body um, and you emit x-rays and then you record the x-rays either as they go through the body or as they bounce off the body. Either, either way works. Um, so you take the, the body or uh, <laughs> cat and you put it in the cat scan and then you, you scan it. So cat, cat is of course an acronym for computed axial tomography. And the axis that we're talking about is this axis right here. So the axis, the long axis of your cat. <laughs> um, and so with the recorded uh, energy that comes back from the cat, <laughs> you can image the surface of the cat, which is great. You know, here we have a nice picture of the cat in electromagnetic rays. Um, but more importantly, you can see inside the cat and see what the interior of that cat looks like and reconstruct things like its skeleton. Um, so in a similar fashion, we, um, we took Mars and we put it in a CAT scan, which is our Sherrod radar here in this example on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. There's that uh, boom antenna. Um, and as it passes over the Martian uh, surface in orbit, it emits these rays that go down. And the vast majority of the energy comes back from the nadir track here, this yellow line across the polar cap you see in the background here. Um, and then um, some, most of that energy comes reflects back off the surface, but a portion of it goes into the subsurface. And you see these reflectors, these layers within the polar ices here, all the way down to the basal um, reflection down here. Um, so this is actually kind of a, you know, an animation done here at JPL a number of years ago when we were first getting these radiograms back from Sherrod. Um, this is all done with actual spacecraft data. This is the Sherrod radiogram here. And of course, uh, MOLA elevations and image, surface imagery were used in producing that animation. Um, so we've been at Mars um, over, well over 10 years now, I think 11 and a half or so. We've been in orbit uh, acquiring data. Um, and we have thousands upon thousands of passes across the polar caps, uh, both in the north here. Um, and I represented this in uh, an elevation view, so where you see a a colored stripe is where we have a Sherrod coverage. Um, and I represent that in the MOLA elevation sense. So you can see the high standing planum boreum or the polar cap in the north, and then the high standing planum australe or the southern polar cap here. Um, and so we get detections um, from icy terrains, of course, in these polar caps. The ice is right at the surface, essentially. Um, and then some of it's buried out in the periphery, um, as well as here in the south. Um, but off the polar caps, we have uh, a fair amount of coverage as well. So at this sort of three kilometer resolution, we have about 31% of the surface um, mapped here in the mid latitudes as well. Um, and so in icy terrains, you know, very, uh, understood to uh, contain water ice in the subsurface, like at Phoenix, uh, we have detections here, Deuteronilus and East Hellas, where there are uh, debris-covered glaciers. Um, and then some ground ice detections here in Arcadia and Utopia. Um, but as you get closer to the equator, um, they tend to be non-icy terrains. Um, they appear to be, uh, from imagery and other data, they appear to be volcanics for the most part, or some sediments here around Valles Marineris. Um, but we'll get into that in more detail. I'm going to mostly focus on the icy terrains, of course, for this talk. Um, 
so er, very early on um, in the, uh, the essentially the commissioning phase of Mars is in, in November 2005, just shortly after they deployed the antenna, um, they, they were just taking a, a, a you know, observation across the surface and then fortuitously happened to go across the polar cap. And a lot of people were uh, very happy to see a strong basal return coming off of the, the polar layer deposits here in this Marsis data, um, which you can see here. So where this, this is the surface out in the, in the um, plains out here, uh, surface return. Um, again, delay time in this direction, similar to depth in this direction. Um, and where it bifurcates here, um, you have the surface here of the, the high standing polar cap, and then this return from the base of that polar cap. Um, and just from this first radar gram, we learned that these ices are probably nearly pure and they're very cold, um, so very low silica content. Um, and as the data built up more and more, um, uh, we also got these nice radar grams from the south polar cap showing a similar uh, thing where you have the surface here and the subsurface detection here. And with uh, you know, hundreds of these um, across different orientations across that southern polar cap, you're able to map out the thickness of the ice over this entire region and essentially strip it off here. Um, this is work led by Jeff Plout, who uh, is here in the room and will be joining us this week uh, for the workshop. And he'll talk, I'm sure, more about Marsis. Um, so I'm going to focus more on Sherrod for uh, much of this talk. Um, so then Sherrod came along a couple of years later. Uh, and in about 2007, we started getting these really beautiful radar grams cutting across that north polar uh, cap here. Um, where you can identify all the, the layering sequences in the cap. And more importantly, when you uh, flatten out the radar gram, you, you convert the delay time to depth. Um, so this is now a depth scale here by assuming this is water ice, which we can assume because we are getting a strong reflection off the base. It's extremely flat lying. Um, if you draw a line across there, there's really no deflection of the crust by the weight of all this ice. And that was a huge uh, finding that we weren't really expecting. Um, and it, it suggests that the, the lithosphere is much thicker uh, on Mars than we thought it was. Um, but enough about that. We're more interested in the, the ground ices. Uh, first, I'll show a couple of um, uh, snapshots of some um, radar volumes that we're creating. So, it's similar to the, the CAT scan now, we, we have enough coverage, you saw that dense coverage on the polar caps, that we can actually create 3D volume representations of the radar data. And that's what this is here. So these are vertical cuts in uh, orthogonal directions here showing layering in this orientation and in that orientation. And then this is what we call a, a, a depth slice, so a horizontal slice through the polar cap. Um, and that shows features like buried craters and what uh, other th known buried or partially buried craters and other features that we think might be buried craters. And these are exciting results from the, the polar caps. Um, similar to this in the south, um, we see again layering. Um, there's some big deposits of CO2 ice and some potential buried craters within the ice. Um, so moving off the polar cap, um, I'm going to show a series of results from a number of those locations that I showed on, on that coverage map, so, uh, kind of working my way off the pole and towards the equator. Um, so these are results from um, the Phoenix landing site. Um, so Phoenix landed in this valley um, here um, in uh, uh, shortly after the um, Sherrod started collecting data. And so we heavily targeted this region to try to get as much coverage as we could at, as that mission was um, landing and, and then while it was on the surface. Um, and we got some uh, good results there. Um, here again, you see the bright surface return in this radar gram and then a later return here, which I've highlighted in this copy of that radar gram below where I've interpreted the, 
uh, subsurface return here. And so, um, you know, dozens of these radar grams all show this similar um, reflector down here. Th this is a simulated radar gram of just the surface uh, response that we expect from the radar. So we can identify like um, artifacts essentially that are from off nadir reflections. Um, so th because that reflector doesn't occur in the simulation, then we have greater confidence that this is actually from the subsurface. Um, so there's a, a, a big deposit of what's likely related to ground ice here in the, the Phoenix area. Um, I would point out though that um, at Phoenix, we were able to scrape into the subsurface and see the, the ground ice right there. In fact, the, the landing um, uh, rocket engine just cleared off a spot where you could see the ice directly under the lander. And then the arm was able to scoop down about four or five centimeters and find ground ice in the, the surroundings. Um, but I, I should point out here that the Shirad doesn't detect that upper interface because it's, it's too shallow. The, again, the vertical resolution here is on the order of tens, uh, 10 meters or so. So we can't resolve the top of the ground ice. We th what we think we might be seeing here is the base of the ground ice. Um, so here's kind of a cartoon um, maybe helping to explain that. So why no detection at the top of the ground ice? Well, so this, this sort of represents the power response of Sherrod to the, the surface and the, uh, to the surface um, of, of Mars. And because it's a, a you know, band limited signal that we sweep through 10 megahertz of uh, the spectrum, we, in processing, we get these what, what are called side lobes. They're lo like increases in power with, with delay time here or depth. Um, and so we have a, kind of a fat lobe here at the surface and then some other lobes here below. So there, the, where we're detecting a reflection, reflection, say, down in here, um, is uh, within this side lobe range. And so there's some ambiguity on if there were a boundary in here, we wouldn't detect it with charade. Um, so this is on the order of about 50 meters or so. Um, so the, these side lobes are, are within about 15 to 20 meters of the, the, um, the surface. Um, so there's, a, there's an ambiguous zone of detect, detectability in this shallow region here. Um, where we do get a strong return, um, we, we can't say for certain that that's the base of the ground ice because the base of the ground ice could have been shallower and then this could be some other um, uh, interface down here. But we definitely get a reflection down here. So it's potentially the base of ground ice but it could just be a layer within the rock or the sediments. Um, Okay, so moving closer to the equator, um, in these, uh, this sort of belt between about 30 degrees and 60 degrees north, um, th this is mapping of these uh, glacier-looking glacier fe features, um, what, what are referred to as lobate debris aprons. Um, and they used, invented this term to describe them because they didn't want to declare them to be glaciers. It, it's kind of a debate over um, how much water ice is actually in these things. Are they really just uh, a small amount of ice with a, that's just lubricating the debris flow? Or is there a large quantity of ice, maybe predominantly ice, in which case they would then truly be uh, debris covered glaciers? Um, and so the, these are surface images showing the morphology um, and then some ground tracks uh, from the radar. Um, and so the radar results um, in the radar results, we get a strong reflection, uh, again, from what we believe to be the base of these uh, features. And because it is so strong, um, that tells us that there's not much attenuation of the radar wave by lithic uh, rocks mixed into the, into the ice. Therefore, it must be very ice rich. And therefore, they are, in fact, debris covered glaciers. Um, but again, we, we don't resolve a, a distinct reflection at the top of these 
uh, of the ice. And so that tells us that the that debris cover is fairly thin, probably no more than about 10 or 15 meters or so of debris on top of the ice. Um, so there, we see that both, that, the prior example was from the south down here near Hellas uh, Impact Basin, um, but we, we see it actually much more widespread in this area called Deuteronilus mense, um, where there's a lot of these um, similar uh, slope, sloping um, debris covered glaciers, and there are also uh, instances of what we call lineated valley fill, um, where entire valleys are filled up with these icy deposits. And we get these um, late reflections from the subsurface that, that tell us that this is, in fact, um, nearly pure water ice filling up these uh, valleys. Um, OK, so then the other um, area that I'm, uh, there are a couple other areas I mentioned that um, we think there may be ground ice um, buried in the, in the subsurface. Uh, and one um, way that we, we get at this interpretation is that um, th this area in particular, uh, Arcadia Planitia, has a lot of these uh, what are called terrace craters where you, you get a, um, a, a break in slope within the crater. And in this case, there's a couple breaks in slope. Um, the, there's a low terrace here and a higher terrace here. Um, and this is um, classically understood that if, if you hit a layered terrain with different material strengths um, with an impact, um, you'll get this sort of layering effect. And that's been borne out in laboratory experiments um, and in um, other uh, explosions uh, um, in the field. Um, so the, the, uh, the, these trains also demonstrate um, surface morphologies consistent with the presence of ground ice. And so the idea then is that there is a, a layer of, of ground ice in the near surface that extends to some depth. And then the strength of the material changes as you go into uh, ice-free sediments or perhaps uh, bedrock, um, which leads to the, the terracing. Um, and so correspondingly in these areas, in these radar grams, we see a fairly faint uh, but, but a clear um, subsurface return uh, corresponding to approximately what the depth of that terrace is. And by actually using high resolution stereo imagery, we can measure the depth of that terrace at about 40 meters. And then that allows us to do that time to depth correction of the radar gram and, and map out that um, uh, interface all across the region. And from that, then we can estimate how much ice is in this uh, area. And it's you know, a huge area, bigger than California and Texas combined. Um, and it extends southward all the way down to 38 latitude, um, which um, gets the attention of people looking to send humans uh, to Mars. Um, so this is a, a similar case where um, now we're in a different region called Utopia Planitia. And here there are these uh, mesas that have uh, holes sort of cut into them, uh, depressions in certain areas. And there's layering in the mesa walls. Um, and then on top of the mesas, there's polygonal terrain that we often associate with the presence of ground ice. So again, uh, Sherrod shows a, a late reflection here that we can map to that. Um, using the, the stereo imagery to measure the heights here, we can get at how deep that is and, and what the properties of that material are. And it appears to be consistent with the presence of ground ice. Um, so uh, now I had mentioned the, um, the equatorial zone where we tend to think that there's probably less ground ice. Um, thermal models show that these zones, there, Ice is not really stable in the, in the surface and probably not to certain depths in the subsurface. So the, the, the general thought going in was that there's probably not any ice in the, in the equatorial zone. Um, however, early in the Mars um, mission, um, they took a number of observations over this uh, terrain called Medusa Fosse. And that's these little high standing uh, areas um, just um, 
in this equatorial zone here. Um, they, they form these kind of long, elongate uh, bodies. Um, and for many years, people have thought that these are um, asphalt deposits. And if you look at the um, surface uh, morphology, it's consistent with eroded um, asphalt deposits. Um, but some people have also speculated that they, they could be um, buried ice deposits, similar to the, the big ice sheets up on the polar caps um, that have um, been eroded down and presumably much older than the polar caps. Um, so when the Mars uh, data was collected um, and we found these subsurface returns uh, below the surface here, and we, we do this uh, depth correction, we come up with a a dielectric property or the speed of the wave through the subsurface that's consistent with either water ice or some low density deposit like an ash fall. Um, so at, at the time, based on the other data that uh, we had, people, people thought, well, so this is probably an ash fall deposit. Um, and, um, and the debate isn't entirely settled yet. Um, so this is a, a very new um, result coming out this week. Um, there should be a press release going out today or maybe later in the week um, about a, a new technique that's being used to um, measure the, that dielectric loss value that allows you to convert from, from delay time to depth. Um, essentially what they do is they take the charade signal and they, they break it apart into different frequency bands and, and see how the power of the response uh, from these reflectors varies from one band to another. And then this gets you a measure of, of what the, um, these losses are, how, how much the signal is attenuated as it moves through the material. Um, so the attenuation of the signal is higher in materials like sediments or rock. Um, and it's lower in water ice. Um, so their results from using this new technique show that um, some of these volcanic terrain detections like Amazonas and Elysium, um, these reflectors that are mapped here were interpreted to be related to uh, volcanic flows and ash deposits. Um, and um, these, the attenuation of that signal is, appears to be consistent with that interpretation. Um, now, look, applying that same technique to the, the low bait debris aprons or the, the debris covered glaciers, um, they find that the attenuation of this reflector down here um, is consistent with the interpretation of it being mostly water ice. Um, so here's where the wrench comes in is at Medusa Fosse, those equatorial deposits, they also find that the attenuation of the signal is actually more consistent with the water ice um, than it may be with sediments and rock. Um, and to throw another wrench in, um, they apply this technique to those um, presumed ground ice terrains in Arcadia and Utopia, and they find that the, those materials are higher loss, and they claim that this really only allows a very thin veneer of near surface ice and that most of this material is, is not actually ice filled. Um, so these are not settled problems. <laughs> um, so the, you know, but what have we learned from the radar um, in general? Uh, to take a step back and sort of summarize what we've learned here. Uh, in the polar regions, they've really um, shed a whole new light on the nature of the layering within the polar caps and the, the timing of that and the, the connection of, of the, the polar deposits to the climate of Mars. Um, but for the purposes of this workshop, um, we're really more interested in those mid-latitude ices. Um, and the radars have sh shown that these strong basal returns in the mid-latitudes associated with low bait debris aprons are indicative of them actually being ice-rich glaciers um, under a fairly thin veneer of debris. It's thin enough that Sherrod doesn't resolve it. Um, the weaker returns in other areas, these uh, uh, presumed ground ice areas, 
um, they may represent extensive deposits of ground ice and they extend down into these zones that are accessible for human missions. Um, so going back to our, our coverage map, um, so these, you know, clearly these polar ices are, are definitely ice deposits. And this, this view that we have of, you know, ices being in these higher latitudes um, and non-ices in the mid-latitudes has kind of been called into question a little bit. Um, so, you know, maybe there's a large component of ice. Maybe these are ash deposits after all, but they're filled up with ice. Um, or at least they have a, you know, a good quantity of ice in them. Um, and then these um, terrains, these ground ice terrains, maybe there's not quite as much ice there as we thought. There's clearly more work to be done in this area. Um, so to kind of wrap up then, what, what is it that we need to learn? What, what do we need to do next? Um, if we really are going to send people to Mars, um, a million people, are we still sending a million people? Excellent. They're going to get thirsty. <laughs> and more importantly, they're going to want to stay alive, and they're going to need power. And the best way to do that is to get some water ice. Um, so if we're going to send people to Mars, we need a better means to locate the accessible ice and establish clearly what its depths and concentrations are. Um, if we want to do that over broad areas to sort of do a reconnaissance of where we really need to go, um, we need a new orbital radar sounder that operates in a broad bandwidth at higher frequencies than the two that we have now. Um, and then when we decide where we're going to go, the rovers need to be equipped, obviously with ground penetrating radar like the ones that we're sending next. Um, but other tools as well. Um, there's some issues concerning radar attenuation in different materials. Even if the water ice is there, maybe we won't be able to see it. Um, so other methods, such as active source seismic, comes to mind with my background, <laughs> um, might be necessary to find that ice. And then, of course, we have to bring a drill or a dozer or something to get the ice out of the ground. So I'll end there, and uh, I want to thank you all for your attention, and I'll take any questions. <laughs>